Welcome, friends, to the How To Heretic. I'm Uncle Mark. And I'm Uncle Dan. And I'm Uncle Doug. And this is your user's guide to life on the outside. That's right. Leaving religion is the first step into a larger, better world. But, 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 but it can also be a scary world. Things work differently now. Ooh, ooh, never <laughs> fear. That's why we're here. We're your audio uncles. And with help from good friends and experts in all sorts of fields, we're going to share the stories and seek the knowledge to build a great life. After all, you only get the one that we know of, so you better make the most of it. Well, guys, hello. hello. We we have a, a show we, that has music. Yeah. We have a show that has a letter. And uh, it, yes. Uh, really? A mercifully short book. And we have a show that has a whole another crazy thing. Yeah, I'm. I'm uh, gonna. I'm gonna talk about. Uh, um, you know, the dance, but really my greatest passion. Dance. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm gonna. I'm before you get to that. I'm gonna start us off with a uh, a very short letter with a lot of bad stuff in it. In a book with a lot of bad stuff in it. Why is anyone still reading it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I am going to right now issue a bit of a trigger warning, because by the at the end we're gonna bring our friend uh, Greg Rogers on who is going to talk to us about human trafficking. Yeah. And we will discuss uh, issues like uh, child sexual abuse. And pornography and stuff like that. And he is, he is our, own, our, our very own secret agent man, with, and he knows of what he speaks, but it is, there's some kind of rough parts of the conversation. So if, but also he's a delightful fella and yeah. worth the listen. So very sure. interesting stuff yeah. coming up. So join us, won't you, on the other side of whatever this is. Uncle Dan. Hey. We've, we've talked on this show about the fact that we, we, we all have uh, re- backgrounds in religion and, yeah. and such. And, and, and to that end, there are moments of my childhood, by, which by no fault of my own, when they make the movie about my life, I would prefer that they start it in my late twenties. <laughs> like, I've already sold a screenplay, Doug. It doesn't. Start yeah, it's too late. Yeah. Just it's too late. The I want to be like in... Darth Vader. I want to show up fully formed. Don't need <laughs> no, to no. know about my past. <clears throat> well, Uncle Mark, you've got some some things that could probably dovetail with my embarrassing. Childhood. Well, before we get there, I want to make some very important points. Hmm. So, okay. <clears throat> as we've discussed many times before, you guys, when we started this podcast, it was originally going to be about my passion. For people who are passionate about fantasy sports. Do you remember that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we, I just remember the hours and hours of, uh, of uh, brainstorming over, over titles. The well, passion of Uncle Mark, I think, is where we settled. I, I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't mean we were going to make fantasy sports league podcast. A fantasy sports leagues. There's a lot of S's in their podcast. We were going to make a podcast about leagues of YouTubers who make fantasy sports leagues. Kind of a dream team that dreams about dream teams, if you will. Hmm. But yeah. you guys vetoed me on the admittedly reasonable grounds that I don't know anything about sports, <laughs> fantasy or otherwise, nor about the people who know enough about sports to fantasize about them or even YouTube. But you did make me a solemn promise. Together we swore a tontine under the watchful eye of Pope Levi the Unclean, our resident stuffed weasel, that on a date of my choosing, I could take over the show and indulge in my second greatest passion. So it is today... We will do our salute to American folk dance. <laughs> Damn it. The tontine. Cody. I'm foiled again. Cody, put crowd cheers over patriotic music here. <clears throat> yes, good people. Today we salute what may be seen worldwide as the most I- iconically American of all, the great American folk dances. The twerk. square dance. Oh, I got it wrong. What were you going to say? I said twerk. Oh, did you? I well, it, was, it should I, be. I thought it was the twerk. I, the- I think... I think after this segment, you're, you will hope, you will wish that it was the twerk. The, the river dance is, is uh, Irish, right? It, well, I, I, the river dance, I, I think, is universal. What about, what about the forbidden dance? Well, it's forbidden for a reason, Doug, and we can't discuss it here. <laughs> yeah. So the square dance, as uh, you know, many of our American listeners, myself included, inexplicably found themselves participating in, in their phys ed class <laughs> in middle school. Oh. And that was because a man who very much admired Hitler and who Hitler very much admired back made goddamn sure we had to. 
So what? take your partner by the hand and let's alamand right down to crazy town <laughs> to see why maybe that do si do is really more of a do si don't. So <laughs> in the late teens and early 20s, a lot of things were sweeping the American landscape. I mean, late 19s and early 1920s, not a fucking garbage we're in now. Um, <laughs> a lot of World War I veterans with severe cases of what would one day come to be known as P- PTSD were uh, all ab- abroad in the land. Shell shock. The shell shock. The deadly Spanish flu was rampant. Uh, uh, there was rampant racist terrorism of the Ku Klux Klan. So I guess it is a time very much like today with a, yeah. a general sort of folksy racism overall. And of course, at that time, jazz. Now, dun dun dun. from here in this idyllic placid year of 2020, most Americans would look very fondly at both square dancing and jazz as both quintessentially American art forms, with jazz being, I think, obviously the much cooler, far more influential one. Yeah. And square dancing being a quaint Western inflected oddity, much beloved by people of generations much older than their grandparents. But back in the increasingly licentious pre-Great Depression days of the Roaring Twenties, not everyone saw it as we see it today. No siree. And one person who very much did not see it that way was the son of William and Mary Ford, who went by the name Henry. <clears throat> yes. That's right. The founder of the Ford Motor Company, the inventor of the modern assembly line, and one of the most important industrialists in wor- world history, Henry Ford did not care for uh, the jazz. Not one <laughs> bit. Was it because he hated black people? Yes. Mm, kinda. Oh, okay. It, it was <clears throat> really more because he hated, and I mean hated, the Jews. That's right. Uh- Oh, <laughs> that's right. Ford despised the amazingly inventive, sexy, amazingly fun, improvisational music inextricably connected to black America because he hated the Jews. Does he does he just kind of hate like but, but the transitive property he hates anything <laughs> th- that sounds like Jews? <laughs> it's Jews and jazz. That was it because the Jews hated so much juice. Like jazz. You hated I, orange juice. Well, or maybe <laughs> I, was there a period? What was there a an undercurrent of Jewish jazz that I just don't know about? There is a connection. On? There is a connection in American jazz between Jews and black people, and it really has more to do with kind of Jewish musicians um, being heavily influenced by it. And then you can look up like klezmer music, which definitely has some some influence on what became American jazz. But, well, and klezmer music can be uh, improvisational in some of the same ways yeah. that that jazz is. That's interesting. Yeah, but it's not, it's not for none of those reasons. No. Right. Does bigotry ever have to make some kind of sense? Never. But <laughs> let's take a gander at his attempt to put some method behind this madness, shall we? <clears throat> Ford bought a newspaper called the Dearborn uh, Michigan Independent, mostly as a vehicle for publishing the hideous protocols of the elders of Zion, in serialized form. Now, we won't waste time with what those are here. You can go back and listen to episode 49 where we did a deep dive into that. They're horrendous. But he used the paper to generally vent his racist spleen as a godly white Christian rich man. In 1921, he wrote in his paper, It is the purpose of this article to put people in possession of the truth concerning the moron music, which they habitually hum and sing and shout day and night. And if possible, wow. to help them see the invisible Jewish baton, which is waved above them for the, for financial propaganda purposes, just what? as <laughs> just as American <laughs> stage and motion picture have fallen under the control of the Jews and their art destroying commercialism. This is from a huge businessman, which is hilarious. So yeah. the business of handling popular songs has become a Yiddish industry. The Jews who captured it in the early days of, ex- of exploitation were, for the most part, Russian-born Jews, some of whom had personal pasts which were unsavory, as the past of many Jewish theatrical and movie leaders have been exposed to be. So, nice guy. Um, <laughs> wow. It gets, that is, it's I, even better. What's nice is that all the evidence that he's provided. So much evidences. It's so well cited. Much That's evidence. what I like. <laughs> so Ford also wrote a three-volume book and distributed 500,000 copies of it for free. See if you can detect what it might be about from this obscure title, fellas. The International Jew, in which <laughs> we, we find this enlightening paragraph. <clears throat> Many people have wondered whence comes the waves upon waves of musical slush 
that invade decent homes and set the young people of this generation in imitating the drivel of morons. Popular music is a Jewish monopoly. A mon- bleh, monopoly. Jazz is a Jewish creation. The mush, the slush, the sly suggestion, the abandoned sensuousness of sliding notes are of Jewish origin. And you had mm. me in abandoned sensuousness, Henry. I know. Yeah. And he, he continues, and it really, really picks up here. Monkey talk, jungle squeals, grunts and squeaks and gasps suggestive of calf love are camouflaged by a few feverish notes and admitted in homes where the thing itself, unaided by scanned music, would be stamped out in horror. Good the Lord. fluttering music sheets disclose expressions taken directly from the cesspools of modern capitals to be made the daily slang, the thoughtlessly hum, um, hummed remarks of schoolboys and girls. Well, so, I, need to, I need to listen to more jazz. That, right? that dude, Henry Ford, must have been awesome at parties. <laughs> uh, yeah, he probably was a hell of a hoot. So <clears throat> really smart move in some ways and really stupid uh, in, in, in some important ways as well. Henry Ford was convinced that jazz was actually not the invention of black Americans, but rather the Jews who used it to promote liquor, laziness, and sex among black Americans, who Henry Ford considered too stupid to resist the siren call of the trumpet, the clarinet, and the upright bass. (laughs) And Ford had plenty of admirers and devotees in this country and beyond. As I mentioned in my torturous intro, Ford very much admired one Mr. Hitler, who very much admired him back. <clears throat> in fact, Henry Ford is the only American to be mentioned by name in Hitler's Creed of Crazy, Mein Kampf. Right. And, and in a very fangirl terms. Henry and Adolf spent most evenings in the 1930s saying, you hang up, no you hang up, no you, <laughs> into their candlestick phones at either end of the transatlantic cable, right up until the U.S. declared war on Germany the day after Pearl Harbor, <clears throat> when Ford changed his tune. Now, Ford, he he didn't suddenly develop a a functional soul and a sense of shame for all the evil he had supported and published. He just knew being pro-Third Reich would be bad for business. So he never recounted his frothing anti-Semitism. He did apologize in a really roundabout way for publishing the protocols, but never for being, went to his deathbed deathbed as a Jew-hating crazy person. To be fair, as possible to this shitbag, he did become one of the leading producers of war hardware during World War II, eventually turning out a B-24 every hour. So cool. Um, but just to Which put it, I'm oily, sure he did, for, he did for free for out of patriotism, right? Uh, who knows? Probably <laughs> right. not. Uh, but just to put an oily orange twist on Ford and his dearest friend Hitler, when Donald John Trump, who was introduced at the Republican National Convention as Donald John President by one of his admirers (laughs) Um, visited a Ford catch that you didn't see that oh an idiot Uh, (laughs) when he visited a Ford motor plant in Michigan just this year out of nowhere he started his slurred speech thusly the the company founded by a man named Henry Ford good bloodlines good bloodlines if you believe in that stuff you got good blood Wow. Uh, Even with everything this idiot has said and done since he got his his elevator, his escalator repaired so he could ride down it, <laughs> that one had me picking my job off the floor. Mm. And it just passed, just washed away. <clears throat> anyway, back to the Roaring Twenties. Ford convinced, uh, uh, convinced that Bolshevist Jews had duped lazy blacks into becoming insanely brilliant jazz artists <laughs> to keep them drunk and lazy while also corrupting the, the flower of white American youth who are having a ball sneaking into speakeasies to drink bathtub hooch and listen to jazz, he cast about for something of equally powerful cultural draw and lure to pull the young people away from the Jewy African decadence and despoilment. Hmm. And what oh. cool thing did this genius of manufacturing and marketing hit upon? It's going to be good. Square dancing. <laughs> 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 Fucking square dancing. Oh, my God. <laughs> so... That's right. To counter the jazz craze that was positively sweeping the country and, and you know, major cities and all around the world, Ford decided to hold a barn dance. So <laughs> in 1923, he bought a hotel and hired a guy to teach square dancing there. And it turned out it was fairly popular with the guests, but they were all old white people staying at Henry Ford's hotel. So <clears> that <throat> this got him all jazzed. I mean not jazzed, <laughs> anti-Semitically enthused, right. to take his message to a bigger barn. 
1923, he published a a wonderful little book called Good Morning. After a sleep of 25 years, old fashioned dancing is being revived by Mr. and Mrs. Henry Ford. (laughs) (laughs) I love the name of that book. Rolls right off the tongue. Yeah, rolls right off the tongue. So with all the money and fervor he had used to send out hundreds of thousands of copies of The International Jew, he set forth to pour his wholesome vision of squeaky clean white boys and girls roundy rounding each other to an old fiddle and banjo version of Turkey in the Straw all across the land. Equally- yeah, because because the truth of the matter is that like you don't the way to counteract moron music is He really was a master of marketing, wasn't he? (laughs) So equally culturally panicked bigots across the country took up the charge, forming clubs to act as pressure groups and were soon not only lobbying their children to go down to the hoedown and chastely kick up their boots, but they were also lobbying their state and local legislators and school districts to force old fashioned social dancing into the schools. And with Ford's seemingly endless resources and influence behind them, they fucking did it. So from the mid-1920s all the way to, checks my notes, now, schools all over the country, all over the U.S. adopted square dancing as part of their phys ed standards. Oh, my God. Millions of puzzled American kids showed up for gym class thinking they were going to get brained in dodgeball yet again, (laughs) only to find themselves standing in a line facing a line of kids of the opposite sex and trying to figure out what an alamand was, what the fuck roll away to a half sash, half sash sash could mean, and what in the world boxing the gnat, which is an actual move, could be referring to. So even though square dancing has waned to something near extinction in schools, there are plenty of kids still doing it in class. I watched some videos on YouTube from this year in states like California with middle and high school kids square dancing uh, in, in their school gyms, and you know what's crazy? They look like they're having fun for the most part. <laughs> However awkwardly, right? It's the old-timey heteronormativity and heteronormativity, that's a word. Yeah. And gender role enforcement aside, um it is a very social dance form. Everybody kind of dances with everyone. Sure. Uh, rather than one-on-one. Kids in the videos say how cool it was to meet and dance with people they never would have had a reason to talk to in school and in a weird way. It is a really equalizing democratic activity. And uh, some of the American... It, re- what's it that? reminds one a little bit of, of the old courtly dances that, that used to happen where, you know, a, a garamond or whatever, where, where everybody sort of was required to sort of switch partners partway through, yeah. continually switching partners, just so that everyone got to know everybody. Yeah, and that's kind of the roots of the actual dance, right? Um, not the music, but the actual dance comes from those. Um, and some of that, that music is actually incredible. I found this great album of old time, just instrumental square dancing music. It's fantastic. Uh, By the way, Garamond is a typeface, not a dance. I don't know what I'm actually thinking of, but I was, I, I just want to put it out there that I, I've realized that I said a word that wasn't the right thing. It sounded no, I, like a word. Doesn't it sound <laughs> yeah. like a dance? It should be a square dance. And and I got to say, if you haven't seen a gym full of second graders concentrating with all their might to remember the moves as they dance to do a square dance, it is fucking adorable. It's super cute. So it's good that it's fun a little bit of exercise and helps break down the barriers of, you know, social cliques in middle school, which can be awful. Uh, but none of those were the intended purpose. The purpose was to wage a culture war against a non-existent Jewish international conspiracy to mentally enslave indolent black people. In order to destroy the white Christian American order and defile its most precious property, white female virtue. That's it. And literally tens of millions of us unwittingly participated in this evil, feverish jihad that haunted Henry Ford's hateful dreams. Unless we think it's all over, the square dancing jihadists that took Ford's dream and ran with it are still at it. And I'm not saying all of them are racist or anti-Semites, of course. And probably most of them likely have no idea the cause they're fighting for was born under that vile sign. Right. But in addition to schools still teach, still teaching square dancing, 28 states were badgered into making square dancing their official state dance by this effort. <laughs> yeah. and, and lest you think uh, this was done back in ye olde timey da- days, the bulk of states adopted it after 1990. What? Oh, my God. Yeah. 53 years after Ford died and 55 years after his BFF Hitler died. Missouri declared it in 1995. 
Nebraska in 1997, South Carolina and Utah in 1994, but whatever, we both suck. But Virginia uh, adopted it in 2011. What? Oh, my God. There are so many types of American folk dance and modern dances from all over the place, but the square dancers absolutely demand their chaste, traditionally white dance form be recognized to the exclusion of all others. Given the history I've laid out, I can't but look on these continued efforts with a jaundiced eye, right? But here's the funny thing, that pretty much every, uh, every form of American music is black music, and I'm not wrong. Fight right. me. Like jazz, blues, ragtime, rock and roll, hip hop, obviously, and yes, even bluegrass and country. The banjo was invented by enslaved black people here, so shut the fuck up. Yeah, it's when Mark, remember when you were at the, the, the uh, cultural floor of the African American History Museum in Washington, D.C., and it's, it's, you know, every bit, everything from it's Michael everything. Jackson's glove to Chuck Berry's Cadillac. Yeah. And, and after just like, you have, after two or three hours, like, Okay, okay, I get it. Yeah, okay, fuck, I suck, I get it. Right. You and, guys invented all the things, all fine. The things. Yeah, and then you go down to the sports floor and you're not going to feel better about yourself if you're a white guy. <laughs> right. so, um, so Ford thought he found a lily white dance from, uh, uh, sorry, found a lily white dance form with which to wage culture war uh, against the scourge of Jewish and black jazz. And while it's true that the square dance itself is derived from European forms of dance and various typefaces, according to Dan, brought to the Americas by white <laughs> colonizers. By the way, it was it was the galliard that I was thinking of. Thank God, we straighten that out. <clears throat> uh, but perhaps most the most recognizably square dance things about square dance turn out to be of black origin, <laughs> <clears throat> and that would be the music and the calling. The most critical part of the square dance band isn't the fiddle, it turns out. It's the caller, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. The guy who calls out the moves to the, or, or gal, usually guy, calls out the moves to the right uh, to the, and to the right of the band. Square dancing is one of the most social forms of American dance. It was designed so everyone, regardless of age or dance ability, could participate. It ain't really hard. You just need some basic moves. So if you threw a party, everyone in your small community wanted to participate. So who is left to play the music? Slaves. That's oh, who. Oh my God! Right. So the children, the old people, everybody did would square dance together, and it was the slaves that played the music. So slaves had to pl- learn to play for all the white assholes out there, and in time had a great effect on the music itself. Um, but as square dancing became super popular in the early 19th century, uh, there weren't enough dance masters or dance teachers to go around to teach everyone the moves. So the bands invented the collar. So this is the iconic voice calling out the dosi dos and the alamand lefts. <clears throat> so the most critical job in square dancing is a black solution to a white problem. Color me surprised. Wow. <laughs> so I very much doubt Henry Ford knew this fact. I very much doubt it. But I do sincerely hope that at the big flaming barn dance in the outskirts of hell, where he is now, he's endlessly being called to reel a jig by a black Jewish dance caller and band forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> so, yeah. Just to finish, I have written a square dance song that I will call now to sum up the whole thing. Swing your partners two by two, kick the Jew and the jazz man too. Pump your elbow like a spigot, you're doing this because of a bigot. Hotsy totsy, a Nazi, da 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 da. What do you think? I, I think you've got a future, buddy. Yeah. I think, yeah. The, the square so, dance, it calls to me. <laughs> yeah. And before uh, before you do any more of that, I, I'm going to promenade out of here. <laughs> well, do you, Mar- Uncle Mark, do you, you might remember this. I hope to God you don't. But I spent a, a period of my youth clogging, which is some kind of cousin. <laughs> I to, love it. To, oh, to, I uh, remember it. I was forced to go dancing. to the Salt Palace, which yes. is a giant venue here, and watch you do it in time with like – 200 kids? Yeah, I did, did some enormous clogging routine. Okay. Yeah. and Patrons, <laughs> we're going to have a patron goal. If we get enough patrons, we're going to make Doug clog, and we're going to put it on the YouTube channel. And It'll it, happen. It is, it, is, it is a dance style invented for white people who can't dance, and Doug it's, still could not do it. It's <laughs> tap dancing, but without uh, the good stuff. Yeah, but you did have a nice piece of red fringe sewn to the back of your white dress shirt. And I, thought I that sure was, did. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yep. It yeah. was a sight. So there you go. Square dancing. Oh, my gosh. It's not for Nazis anymore. Let's just burn it all. Let's element out. (laughs) 
Uncle Dan. Uh, hey, what? Yes. Hello. Uh, I, hello. It's Uncle Are Mark. You there? Here. Uncle Is Mark here. Ah. Uh, Do you copy? <laughs> Roger Wilco. Uh, uh, d- d- cut, kilo seven. Hotel November. Do you copy? Do you, Uncle Dan? Are I understand you are a fan of books. You know, uh, you, you understand wrong. Well, you're a fan of book. I'm a fan of well. You know, the, I do have a favorite book. Sure. I I I think it was was it last week that I pronounced it the bad book. <laughs> the bad Recently, book anyway. full of goodness, full of nonsense. It's yeah. It's one of the worst books of all time, and what's great is if you if you look at it uh, towards the end there, you get to read some crazy dude's letters to a bunch of other people. Well, yeah. uh, if epistles, you, if you yep. will. And if you think it's a bad book now, uh, twenty minutes from now, you're not going to have a better opinion. Challenge um, accepted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's well, see what you got, Douglas. Dear, dear uncles, it seems that try as we might. We just can't seem to stop this once great nation of ours from punching itself in the dick. (laughs) Two days ago was the 57th anniversary of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, where Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech. Although many thousands of people uh, marked the anniversary by returning to that spot and advocating for that dream, it seems further away than ever. First, we have to get through our present waking nightmare before we can even think about dreaming. That speech is, of course, every racist's favorite speech on race. (laughs) <laughs> because it contains the only words that any racist can quote of Dr. King, quote, we should not be judged by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. This is, of course, not what Dr. King said. The actual quote was, quote, <clears throat> I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Mm. It's amazing what a little context can do or what a little lack of context can destroy, isn't it? Yeah. Indeed, that's why the right in this country seems to be waging a war on context. Yeah, well, I'm only- happy to judge them by the content of their character, if that's what they want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're not going to come out great. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, it is only through the context of the American slave trade that we can truly understand how and why we find ourselves in this intractable racial mess today. Eliminate that context, and you can blame victims for their own suffering. See the life and times of Clive and Bundy. And, of course, in the context of the American slave trade, slave owners found justification for their evil in a little book that we here on the How-To Heretic don't much like, the Holy Bible. Yay. And it's in, it's in that little book it, that we find it's that even... Favorite. It's our uh, We love it. We can't seem to get away from it. Uh, it's in that little book that we find an even tinier book that did a lot of heavy lifting and giving shade to the antebellum South and is therefore still causing harm to this day. Today, let's talk about the itsy-bitsy evil that is the book of Philemon. Oh, yeah, it's a a huge favorite of mine. Yes. Philemon is the third shortest, or if you're not into the whole brevity thing, the 64th longest book in the whole Bible, (laughs) coming in at a bare 335 words, as always adhering, yeah, it's tiny, as always adhering to Uncle Doug's first rule of the Bible, this makes Philemon my third favorite book in the Bible, with only second and third John coming in shorter. With 245 and 215 words, respectively. The best Bible stories are the shortest ones. That's correct. Interestingly, of the five longest books in the Bible, Jeremiah, Genesis, Psalms, Ezekiel, and Exodus, we've dedicated three full uncles and seven segments to the cause, with me covering Genesis Genesis in episodes 120 and 121, Uncle Mark covering Ezekiel in episode 86. That's dreadful. And Uncle Dan almost covering Exodus in episodes 106, 107, 108, and 109. (laughs) Well, I had to leave some for for the spirit of Elijah. He he got lost in Exodus, which is probably (laughs) as it was meant to be. Pretty telling. Don't worry, Jeremiah and Psalms, your time is coming. As longtime listeners will no doubt remember, we have tackled the structure of the Bible in general and the New Testament in particular many times. But there is something interesting about the tiny book of Philemon. The New Testament is broken down into four main parts. The Gospels, consisting of the four retellings of the life of Jesus. The History, consisting only of the Book of Acts, which I talked about in episodes 149 and 150. The Letters, consisting of 20 epistles, 14 by Paul, although only seven are considered to have actually been written by him. And the Apocalypse, consisting only of the Book of Revelation, which I talked about in episodes 58 and 60. We really have dedicated a lot of time to this stupid book. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Each of these four sections can be broken down into subsections, such as the three synoptic Gospels and John, 
the Pauline epistles and the non-Pauline epistles. If you keep breaking it down, the book of Philemon finds itself alone, and this is true, in section 3, subsection A, sub, subsection 2, sub, sub, subsection I, as the only non-pastoral, individually addressed, authentic letter written by Paul. So... That stuff Whoa. is that's dynamite fact then. That's, that's put like, that put that in kind your of fife stats. and smoke it. <clears throat> yeah. I hope Lord. you never have to use that fact. I need a and cool l- drink. <laughs> <laughs> like I mentioned before, it is mercifully short, consisting of a single page of text. However, terrible things can indeed come in tiny packages. Take for example the coronavirus or Danny DeVito. Um Oh, oh. No, no, look. Oh, no, oh, look. Okay, oh, everybody. We pro Danny. <clears throat> we are pro DeVito on this look, show. Everybody thinks he's great, but that's just because the truth is being suppressed by Big DeVito. So. <laughs> is Big DeVito the name of his brother, Rob? <laughs> big, big Rita Rudner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so anyway, boy, has this tiny book been responsible for a veritable megatonnage of suffering. So before we dive in, let's talk about the contents of the letter, because it seems fairly out of place in the Bible for reasons we'll explain. And if one were not paying attention, one might miss the downright evil implications in what it says, and more importantly, what it does not say. Um, The book is a letter written by Paul while he was a prisoner in Caesarea to a wealthy, powerful Christian in Colossia named Philemon. Paul, who is imprisoned with his traveling companion, Timothy, addresses the letter to Philemon and to Apphia, probably Philemon's wife, and Archippus, probably Philemon's son. After, after several verses of pleasantries in which Paul is clearly trying to butter up Philemon, even mentioning how he, Philemon, quote, refreshes the bowels of the saints. I don't know what that means. <laughs> That's got to be a coffee enema, right? Um, <laughs> oh, I don't know. The mind can just wander on that for a while. Yeah. Take, yeah, let it stew. Yeah. Paul gets, finally gets on to the business. Uh, the point of the letter is to plead with Philemon to free one of his slaves, Onesimus, who has run away to Paul and converted to Christianity. Paul has written, huh. this, written this entreaty and sent Onesius himself back to Philemon to deliver the letter. Uh, Paul, that's probably a bad idea. <clears throat> yeah, yeah that doesn't seem... for obvious reasons. Yeah. Paul begs Philemon to see Onesius not as a runaway slave, but as a brother in Christ, and even promises to pay any debts that One- One- Onesimus might owe Philemon. We don't know what wrong Onesimus has committed besides running away, However, under Roman law, runaway slaves fared no better than their counterparts in the American South and could be punished by their owners in any way they saw fit, including execution. Right. So Paul further hints that not only would it be great if Philemon forgave Onesimus, but also it would be be super nice if you could see fit to free him and let him return and work with me. Thanks. Paul was counting on his prominence in the Christian church to sway Philemon, who again was a recent convert to the church, as were all Christians at the time. Yeah. Um, we don't know whether Philemon found this argument persuasive and freed Onesimus or killed him, but the inclusion of the book in canon probably means things worked out okay, at least for Onesimus. Paul does mention Onesimus one time in the Epistle of Colossians, but it's unclear if the epistle was written right before or right after Philemon, so it doesn't help us know what eventually happened. So, why include this little book in the New Testament at all? There is no preaching done, no doctrine laid out, Jesus is only mentioned in passing, and mostly it's just a pretty pedestrian letter from one dude to another. Well, Mm. if you read the myriad articles by your various and sundry Christian groups and think tanks, think tanks is in quotes, uh, and they are myriad, this little nugget not only shows how good and decent a guy Paul was, but further it demonstrates that even in in the early Christian church, slaves were considered people. In fact, they say this so often and so loudly that one might suspect that they are overcompensating for something, and one would be right. Now, <clears throat> the Bible and Paul himself are responsible for some indisputably pro-slavery passages. Um, a couple favorites are what would come to be called the curse of Cain or the curse of Ham, when in Genesis 9, Ham saw his dad's waggly bits, and Noah proclaimed, quote, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And God God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Um, There's another one, a famous one in both Colossians and Ephesians, when Paul himself said the following, quote, Servants, which is slaves, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling. 
in singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good and doing and will, good will doing service as a, as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Um, those are pretty bad. <clears throat> Um, while Philemon, Philemon says nothing as explicit, it is at least as nefarious, perhaps more so because, it seem, uh, because of its seeming innocuousness. This tiny little book in the Bible, often referred to as Paul's postcard, tells <laughs> us two unequivocal things. One, I, Paul, and the Christian church I am the head of have absolutely no problem with the institution of slavery whatsoever. Right. And two, you can absolutely positively, positively, undeniably be a good and faithful Christian and own slaves. Paul does not inveigh against uh, the evil of slavery. In fact, he recognizes its authority and offers his own money to satisfy it. Nor does he reprimand Philemon for owning slaves and command him to stop the practice. In fact, he calls Philemon, who is a slave owner, his dearly beloved, and speaks effusively of Philemon's, quote, love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. It seems clear that modern Christianity is aware of the moral landmine in the text and has been buying ink by the barrel full to try and say that it doesn't say what it says. <laughs> Their main justification was that slavery was so ingrained in, in Roman, Greek, and Hebrew societies at the time that it would have been either unwise or suicidal to challenge it. Here, for example, is Professor Beverly Ro- Roberts Gaventa's attempt at a scriptural triple lindy, quote, <laughs> An abolitionist would have been at the same time an insurrectionist, and the political effects of such, move, such a movement would have been unthinkable, end quote. Here is the problem with all that noise. <laughs> you cannot claim that your religion and the book it is based on are the timeless, sublime, moral pinnacle of human endeavor and say it's just a product of its time and place. Yeah. You cannot claim the perfect ethical immutability of your God and have a book like Philemon. Well, and it's not like... The rest of the New Testament isn't – like whenever you hear Christians talking about – what's that guy's name again? Oh, yeah, Jesus. Right. Mm-hmm. They're talking about a guy and they're proud. They're talking proudly about how he bucked all of the social You're, norms yeah, of the he time. He was a political revolutionary as well as, as, well as a, you know, a religious one. You're 100% correct. The very religion, Christianity, was an insurrectionist religion. Yeah. It rejected and supplanted Yahweh, Jupiter, and Zeus at the same time. Yeah. Uh, why could it not have you, outlawed you're slavery? Get some pushback. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. Why could it not have outlawed slavery, even if only inside itself? Right. If taking on the Roman Empire over slavery was political suicide, it could have at least been a religion that did not itself take and own slaves. Yeah. The answer, of course, is that it could have, but it didn't want to. Christians are once again left in the terrible position of trying to explain away the rank immorality of their founding texts while trying to claim the moral high ground, they have absolutely no business being near. Sorry, guys, you were wrong on slavery. You are disqualified. Yeah. <laughs> guys, I'm starting to think the Bible is not the Liahona it's been made out to be. <laughs> uh, well, it is because the Liahona was also useless. and yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, and- so there it is. It's, it's a little tiny book uh, that just absolutely 100% condones slavery. Yeah. From so. from the true head, from the true head, uh, the, the real founder of Christianity, Paul. Exactly, that, yeah. and that's that's a really good point because it's not something lost in the Old Testament that can be easily dismissed as oh, the old, old prophets. Jesus yeah. came and changed everything. This was the post Jesus Christianity yeah. that had this this view and this opinion. Yeah. So, uh, you know, throw it on the pile and then set it on fire. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm as, uh, I'm against it and. Uh, if I had known Philemon was that short, I might have not fucked around with Ezekiel and lost a week. <laughs> yeah. yeah, now now it's going to be a mad dash for the for the rest of the short books in the Bible. Yeah, true. Well. At, at least Ezekiel had a fucking flying saucer. You, uh, That's true. <laughs> you just got the boring slavery stuff. <laughs> All right. Well, cool, Doug. Thanks for that uh, uh, fun Yay! justification. You yeah. know, and it's, it, uh, again, when when Christians talk about well. You know the abolitionists, the, the American you know slave slavery abol- abolitionists used the Bible to justify abolition. Well, so did everybody else on the other side. Yeah, right. right. And, and this book, you know, a lot of so- uh, Southern slave owners 
saw themselves as Philemon, mm. as good, holy Christians who owned slaves. And the book of Philemon proves that they were right. Yeah. Just saying. Right. So yep. there you go. Well, the Bible. Well. Buy it, burn it, bury it. <laughs> yeah. don't, don't, don't buy it. Don't, don't buy it. Just, buy it. Yeah, go to, go to a hotel room and there's a guy named Gideon left one by the bedstand for you. So. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, thanks, Doug. <laughs> Well, fellas. Well, well. Yes. Uh, here, we, you know, we're we're just shouting into the void here. We're just talking to, into the wind. And you know the, what happens black... when you shout into the void? What? It shouts back at you. Uh, or, or, <laughs> and this I think is a much better outcome. Mm. It gives you some money. Hey. And yeah. I, I, and that's a really lovely thing. So, yeah, uh, it, we... according to the Supreme Court, money is speech, so that counts. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll allow it this one. <laughs> Thank time. you. Uh, but yes, uh, we had some folks give us a little bit of their uh, hard-earned coin, and boy, do we appreciate it. Uh, and so we need to give some thanks. So thanks, first of all, to uh, Harold, who gave us some money on the on the PayPal, and new patrons Donna and Jasmine. Thank you guys so thanks much so much for, so for joining uh, with all the other patrons who have uh, who who are now enjoying the privileges that patrondom. Uh, affords them yes and uh, the, and if you would like the to, velvet rope yeah exactly and if you would like to understand what privileges those are and perhaps join these people you can do so by going to howtoheretic.com clicking on the support us uh, little button there you'll be you'll you'll be able to go to the patreon page you'll see what 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 treasures await you uh and then you can and then you just sign up it's super easy you decide how much you want to give us and uh, and and that's how much we know you love us. Uh, so do that, or Uncle Mark. How else can they support you, us? You know, you can you can build a constellation for us, and 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 as you know, constellation is defined by Webster's Dictionary as five stars or more. Right. So uh, that's what you can do. Go to any place where you get these podcasts and hit the five stars. Hit it again. If you see anybody hitting four or three, hit them yeah. um, and just uh, brighten our sky. And, uh, and t- together one day we will uh, join each other under it and dance once again. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thanks, yeah. you guys, so much. Uh, let's do some more show. Thanks, guys. Toulouse. Uncle Doug. Hello, I'm here for some reason. Uh, <laughs> I said you could say that every week, and we still don't know what that reason is. <laughs> but uh, apparently, Doug, here, even in our, our fair city of, of Salt Lake, the Queen City, as Brigham Young wanted to call it, uh, uh, we have a, a, tra- a, a traffic problem. Do we? Yeah. Yeah. I, it, I haven't left the house in six months. I don't really know. <laughs> yeah, really, how would we know? How would we even know? But apparently our attorney general just won't shut up about it. So <laughs> we got a traffic well, problem. Dan, what do you know about it? Well, I, I'll, I'll get to it uh, circuitously, uh, just like traffic in Salt Lake City. As you um, do, yeah. Longtime listeners, or those who have gone back and plumbed th- the depths of our back catalog, will recall that way back in episode 23, mm. you, Uncle Mark, took a powerful look at the terrifying nightmare that was the satanic panic. Yes, that's exactly and, right. <clears throat> and like real nightmares, i.e. the crazed imaginings of our brains at night... It turned out uh, that it was all bullshit and never actually happened. Right. But the frenzied desire to stop it actually ended up ruining thousands of lives. Easily, yeah. Well, that if that idiotic moment in our history points to anything, it's that humans are dingbats. We right. love to be scared, and when we're scared, rather than being wisely skeptical of outrageous claims, we are actually super energized by them. <laughs> but Uncle Dan, I hear nobody asking me, surely we've learned our lesson and nobody would be like that now. Well, nobody. Unfortunately, that's not the case. The new crazed conspiracy theory that's actually making things worse for people experiencing a real problem is human trafficking. Yay. Utah's own... A- yeah, and you mentioned Utah's Attorney General, Sean Reyes, who yeah. actually talked about this issue a little bit on the national stage when he spoke at the Republican National Convention this week. I don't know if you guys caught that. Not worth looking up. But 
Here's the thing. I, I couldn't hear him over Kimberly Guilfoyle screaming. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I, I didn't have my TV on, that. and I could hear her. <laughs> yeah, we were all deafened a little yeah. bit, so it was hard to hear the other speakers. Yeah. Uh, listen, human trafficking is real. Uh, it's a terrible thing that actually happens. But it's not happening in the way that these idiots are talking about it. So... I've de- we've decided to bring in somebody who knows way more about the horrifying realities of awful humans than I do to talk about it. Uncle Mark, do you want to do you want to set this guy up? You want to introduce our friend? Yeah. So this is we're we're kind of lucky to have this expertise on calls. So this is an old friend of mine, Greg Rogers. Uh, who, Greg, you were a uh, undercover special agent for thirty years. Thirty years in the FBI. Yep. Thirty years and. Uh, Greg, I think Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, your two main beats were taking down uh, kind of uh, militia, white nationalist, neo-Nazi types, and the other one was tracking down American uh, uh, pedophile sex tourists in Southeast Asia. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. So Greg uh, Greg was out there watching the walls, and um, I'm pretty glad that the people Greg took off the street are off the street. Yes, so indeed. welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Nice. So, Greg, uh, first, I, can you tell us, I mean, Uncle Mark told us a little bit about you, but tell, tell us about you and, and your work, uh, especially the work in, uh, in, in, in pedophilia. Yeah, sure. I started working um, uh, cases involving um, just, I don't, I don't mean to downplay it, but just to say just, but I mean, I began by working uh, child pornography matters um, I'd been an undercover for a while, working violent crimes, narcotics, biking gangs. But then I started working child pornography cases uh, undercover and um, working people here in the United States. And is uh, that's quite a promotion, isn't that wonderful? What a nice thing! <laughs> yeah, sadly, <laughs> yeah. sadly, it's uh, uh, there. There's more of that work than we can handle. I mean, it's uh, yeah. Uh, and ironically, I mean, actually, I mean, if you uh, Utah being a small population. When I got transferred to the Salt Lake City office, we were busier here than any office I'd ever been in. We we prosecute as many um, child pornography cases in Utah as any office in the United States, and that doesn't mean per capita. I mean pure numbers. Oh, oh my that's God. something to that's be proud of. Insane. Yeah, it's I, wow. Utah. And do you have a sense of why Utah was a hot spot on that? Um, you know, it, it's a guess. It's uh, but it's. Um, uh, I don't know, repressed sexuality, I, I, I did some strange, um, because when I, when I got transferred here, I thought the work would be much less than in, you know, San Antonio, right. other places I'd been in Texas where you have millions of people in the same cities. Uh, I'd worked with friends in LA and much bigger offices and, um, Utah was, uh, it was stunning. It's off the charts. And, oh, wow. Um, yeah. And then, it's weird yeah. that the Tourism Bureau hasn't picked up on that. Because yeah. That's, a, yeah, that's an impressive stat. They don't, <laughs> they don't put that out. And I think in wow. Utah, quite frankly, it's a uh, it's a community with um, uh, a lot of uh, trust issues with, um, mm-hmm. you know, and um, I worked a ton of cases and I'm not trying to be uh, negative about any, you know, particular church. But I mean, I worked a lot of cases where people were in leadership positions in the Mormon church and, um, they were trusted. So you're, you're in a, on a safe podcast venue to say, say that. I think okay. Fine. okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 you know, and we'll get back, <coughs> sorry, we'll get back to the idea of like churches and, yeah. and, and, and how all that happens. But I do want to talk about your time overseas mm-hmm. because you spent a bunch of time Going to uh, to different countries and uh, and and going after Americans who were who were going there specifically uh, to right. do something off. Yeah, I got recruited with. Uh, really, there were just um, uh, five of us that got recruited to start going to Southeast Asia and um, um, just to track child sex tourists because in. Uh, we passed a, one of the odd times that the government actually does something really well. They 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 passed a, a child sex tourism statute, the Protection Act, in like 2003, and 
all we needed to do to arrest Americans that were traveling overseas was to prove that they traveled to have sex with minors. So our job was to go over there. We'd go over for two weeks, a month. Sometimes we were in Cambodia, uh, Vietnam, Thailand, um, um, gosh, the Philippines, Indonesia. We would be invited by these countries to come and uh, find out where the Americans were going, where they were meeting the minors, how this was all set up. So we just go over there and be undercover as pedophiles hanging out with those guys. Um, and fortunately, again, it was one of the strange times where the government actually did it right. They, they formed that statute in such a way that the Americans didn't have to actually perpetrate on a kid to get arrested. So we could get them into conversations about how many times they've been in this country, uh, how many kids they've had sex with. We just act like we were kind of new and nervous about it and scared and didn't know where to go. And these guys would start acting like your mentor. I mean, it was like a, a, something they thought was, a, you know, a compliment to them. So they'd start. It's a, it's a very kind community. It's a you very, they'd really very look out kind, for each yeah, other. Exactly. Yeah. And they would be very helpful. I mean, they'd tell you which clubs to go to, you know, which madams to meet with. And so it was, um, you know, and you'd get a, you'd just essentially get a confession that they'd traveled over there to have sex with minors. They'd done it before. And uh, that's all we needed to prove. And so. Um, we would, we would get a lot of guys, um, you know, that way. Mm. Wow. That, that, I just can't imagine the psychological fortitude necessary to, to, to hang out with those guys and, 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 you know, try to convince them that you were friends with them and all that sort of stuff. That, it, that must have been an, it an incredible on, It weighs mindfuck. on you a little bit. And they, um, they, when you're doing that, we have to go see psychologists every six months to make sure we're squared away and not going off the rails. And, <laughs> you know, it's different. It's different work in those kind of cases because when you're working bikers and, uh, you know, which I did a ton of, I, it, it's, it, it, I don't mean to downplay, but it's, it's actually, it's kind of a lot of fun. And uh, you're riding around going to Sturgis, you know, riding around being a biker with these guys. And if I don't pop them for 30 days, 60 days, you know, a year, I don't care. I mean, it's drugs on the street. And it's all that kind of stuff. But um, but when you're working pedophiles and you know someone is perpetrating, especially on a on a road trip, they are perpetrating every day that they are in one of those foreign countries. So. It keeps you up at right. night because every day you don't get that guy, he, he's he's damaging some young kid's life. So it's a it's a different it's a different way of um, you know it's a whole different type of case. So it keeps you uh, uh, it keeps you going. Yeah. yeah, yeah, indeed. Well, okay. So you clearly, obviously, have uh, have a sense of. The realities, you know, working working the the child pornography beat, working this beat. You have a sense of the realities of how this works, right. which is why I wanted you to come and talk to us. Because here's the thing, uh, I, you uh, like human trafficking has blown up as an issue in the United States, and a lot of it has been fueled by uh, some pretty in, some pretty in, uh, outrageous claims. Made by people on like 4chan and QAnon believers and stuff, which all started, of course, with Pizzagate, which right. if, for our listeners who don't understand or, or don't remember it, you know, Pizzagate was this uh, this theory, this conspiracy theory that came about because uh, because of that WikiLeaks leak uh, w with all of John Podesta's uh, emails to Hillary Clinton and right. to other people. Somebody hacked his email and. And then they uh, they it leaked was, it. It was Greg that hacked it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Greg, well, you unleashed hell, buddy. If, yeah. if uh, I was able to hack your computer, you do not have a very decent uh, security system. Because <laughs> I am no pro. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> well, so, so then people started to see Podesta talking, uh, emailing people about pizza. And somehow they got the idea that pizza was code for... Uh, for for trafficking in children, right. and that and then you know this pizza joint, this you know ping pong pizza joint in D.C. gets caught up in everything, and it all you know it culminated sort of when that guy when when a you know a young twenty something year old man 
busted into the place with guns, literal guns blazing, and uh, you know, an AR-15 and a handgun, and fired a couple shots into the ceiling or whatever, only to find that that place not only didn't have children locked up in a basement uh, ready to be trafficked, but didn't even have a basement. So it, it was pretty funny how it was just like the scene in Pee Wee's Big Adventure when everybody was laughing at him outside the Alamo. <laughs> right, yeah. There's no Alamo in the basement. <laughs> yeah, the basement in the yeah. Alamo. Yeah, it was like it was but, just like and you'd that. Think that you'd think that that would have put an end to the conspiracy theory, theorizing. Uh, just such a very obvious uh, uh, stop, you know, proof that, that what they had been claiming wasn't happening. Yeah. But no, it has spiraled even further out of control. Now people are implicating people like Oprah and Ellen and Piers Morgan and Tom Hanks. Basically, anyone who's, a, who's famous or left-wing, uh, because obviously it doesn't apply to people that they like. And, uh, and it's got... So, so the image in people's minds is of literally dungeons in the basements of mansions of the wealthy elite with foreign, mostly foreign children in chains. Yeah, is and there? Is it, there they're talking about Greg, hundreds of thousands, Dan. I was looking today, and and the claim from a Republican candidate for Congress, this guy who spoke at the RNC, is hundreds of thousands of children. Right, <clears throat> and let's be clear that there are there are probably hundreds of thousands of missing children in the world, uh, maybe more. Uh, I, I saw I saw a figure. The problem is I don't know. It's hard to know what to believe when you look at some of this stuff. So, Greg, in your experience, is that what child trafficking looks like? No, it doesn't look like that at all. That's the, the, the human trafficking. It's in. in uh, I, I, I know I sound like a hopeless cynic, but I am about the politicians who are doing this kind of nonsense. It's become an industry and it's a uh, it's a very successful way to raise funds and um mm. you know you can to be clear you're saying that talking about yes. human trafficking is an industry yes. not the actual trafficking oh of no humans. no the act the human trafficking is it's it's horrific and i've seen real human trafficking uh too many times but it's uh when i hear politicians here in the states making nonsensical claims like that it's uh it's maddening because it, it uh, denigrates the actual problem. And it also uh, but they're you know, they they're very successful in using those arguments, uh, not even real arguments, just statements to um, to, to raise tons of money as, as evidenced by our attorney general here, who uh, you, you referenced his speech where he called himself a warrior because yeah. of his warrior heritage, which. I'm not sure what that was. I was I was a little nervous he was going to start doing a some kind of you know a haka dance or something there and rapping, <laughs> but uh, um, thankfully he didn't. But it was uh, you know that's it, it, it's nonsense. But he's he raises a, an immense amount of money, um, you know, talking about human trafficking all the time when he knows nothing about it. Well, you say he knows nothing about it, but I do want to talk to you about this. He actually went on an operation with Operation Underground Railroad yeah. into Colombia right. himself, posing as a, as a security guard for uh, for this group of of fake guys who were gonna who were claiming they were gonna invest in a thing, and he claims that they actually like foiled an underground. A, a, a ring of of traffickers. So, like, what do you? What are your thoughts about groups like under Operation Underground Railroad? Yeah, Operation which Underground is making Railroad making a lot of money. Is right a now. very successful money raising venture. They've done uh, um, the Ballard who started Operation Underground Railroad is an ego run amok that uh, knows he should know better. He was a federal agent for a short amount of time before he left the Department of Homeland Security and started Operation Underground Railroad. Um, we do not work with them. The FBI wouldn't work with them because they, I actually set them up at a meeting in Thailand to meet with our assistant legal attache there. They came over babbling about having Navy SEALs and wanted to drop into the country armed and hitting um, places that they believed, you know. And I mean, you had to have basic conversations with them like, you, you know, in Thailand, you're not 
cops. You're not even cops in the States. You can't drop into a foreign country with weapons and start raiding brothels. It's uh, you, you end up in a Thai jail if you do that. Right. And we won't do anything for you if that happens. So, um, but that's what they were promising. That's how they started raising money, right? That they were right. literally going to be this kind of Jump SEAL in. Team 6 that they, was going to go uh, rescue children. Yeah, they've changed their website a lot. It used to have a bunch of people who were purportedly former SEALs, and they called themselves Jump Teams going into these foreign countries, which is it, it's just crazy. And it's uh, But they've raised a ton of money. They've got their CrossFit gyms and, uh, you know, <laughs> And, uh, and, and, you know, in Huntsman's campaign, you had Ballard, uh, you know, um, is one of the guys in the trip supporting Huntsman. So it's, um, that would be John Huntsman, yeah. who was a former Utah, uh, uh, governor and, and was running to be governor again. Yeah. After who's, his, who's considered the, the sane one. Right. And, so yeah. yeah. Right. What's amazing <laughs> is that this, ba- this Tim Ballard who of Operation Underground Railroad has done such an effective job. Of of marketing or of messaging, right? That he's yeah he's perceived as a as a hero. Oh and, yeah, and it's and it's all predicated on this big macho commando sort of idea. But is that the best way to fight human trafficking? No, and it's it's a great way to get yourself in a Thai or a Cambodian jail. I mean, it's uh, or a graveyard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 a, it's a nonsensical way to approach the problem because even as FBI agents. We are cops, but when we go into a foreign country to assist with arresting uh, uh, U.S. citizens that are traveling, we have to be invited in by that foreign country. We're not, you know, we're we're federal agents here. We're we're tourists in Cambodia, Thailand, right. any place else. <clears throat> right. We have to be invited in by the country. It, there's all sorts of stuff that has to go on with our ambassador and their people. And um, they know what we're doing. We cooperate, cooperate with their national police when we're there. We work together. And uh, there's, there's a whole lot that goes into making that happen. And uh, a bunch of private citizens in the United States can't run around the world with <laughs> AR-15s and act like they're jumping out of planes and going into brothels. I mean, that's, that's, um, that's not a way to fix this. And, and if you really understood the problem, they would know that um, – while you may have some success in taking these young children out of these brothels, you, you've helped those young children you took out that day, but they're replaced the following day. So right. you, you did nothing to solve the larger problem. So what is so, you know, we've talked about what isn't happening, which is, you know, all of these these elite rings of people chaining people up and, you know, kidnapping and, and, and chaining kids up. Right. I want to talk a little bit about what actually is happening and what is a problem and, and what we should be looking for. In the, it's, it's interesting because around the world, I mean, the, the worst things that you've heard about are happening. There are, right. in Southeast Asia, there are brothels I could go into any day of the week. Um, there are in parts of the cities in Bangkok, Pattaya, Phnom Penh, where you, you go in and there, there are adults that are dancing on the floor. But if you know the right madam to talk to, you can get directed to where you can find whatever age you're interested in. And um, so that's clearly going on and it's horrific. There are, in other countries, there's all sorts of human trafficking that has to do with uh, forced labor, um, You know, I mean, so these things are prominent in different parts of the world, but those things aren't happening here. There is uh, there are clearly here. There are circumstances where, for instance, uh, MS-13 Central American gang that's uh, become very active in the United States does take young ladies and uh, force them into prostitution to make money. That's human trafficking. So right. that happens here. That's going on in, in major cities. And um, so I don't want to say it's not going on here, but it's not going on here like it's going on in uh, different parts of the world um, in, in, in any way. I mean, nothing to even right. closely approximate it. 
Well, so what? So one of the things that I've read about that I know that is happening and that is what we should be concerned about in the United States and, and other parts of the world is I, one of the definitions, uh, one of the things that is defined as human trafficking is any time a child, uh, someone underage, is, uh, is, is forced or, or coerced or, uh, f- you know, defrauded into uh, some any form of commercial sex act right. that's considered human trafficking, right. and the thing is that that does happen here. Yes, it does. But it's not it's not rings of of elite organizations that's do, that are doing it. It's their family members. No, sadly, that was going to say it's absolutely most often family members, and that happens on you can get on any number of encrypted sites if you have pass codes to get on, where uh, they're full of movies of young children who are being molested um, in every hideous way you can imagine. And the vast majority of those movies were made by family members with their uh, the, either their own children or nieces and nephews. Um, and um, yeah, and then they trade those um, movies. Um, most often, they, 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 you know, it's not a money maker. They're trading those movies to get movies from other people. So right. usually, so it's just uh, just to feed their own yeah. d- desires. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's not well, and like it also, they're selling those things. And and also, uh, and we you alluded to this before, but uh, there is there are a few uh, actual major organizations that participate in this, but they're usually called things like the Catholic Church. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus, yeah. I mean, so so I mean, I, you know, one of the things that Imagine I wanted to being a pedophile people... with your own country and diplomatic immunity. I mean, that's something. Yes. Right. right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I you know, that's one of the things that I wanted to make sure that people were aware of is that what don't don't bother looking for, you know, places where 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 ki- you know, dungeons where kids are chained up. Look for adults who who the children are supposed to trust grooming children to trust them and do things for them that, that they shouldn't be doing. No, and it's, that's what the problem is. Yeah. And it's, um, and these people are the, there, there are sadly, uh, individuals who are very, very good at it. I mean, and they can groom, um, I don't know how many parents I've interviewed whose children have been abused by <clears throat> school teachers, church leaders, um, and they just can't believe it happened. But you're, you're, when you're talking to the parent, you'll be like, you let this guy, you know, like a third grade school teacher, we were, you, you let this guy take your boy on camping trips by himself. You let him spend the night at his house. You let him go over there to do gaming. You know, and it's right. and you're like, what? What were you? Didn't you think that was unusual that this third grade <laughs> teacher had all this interest in your, you know, eleven year old, a nine year old boy? And um, yeah, but it's these guys are are unbelievably talented at uh, gaining the trust of not only the kid, which is most important to them, but of their parents, you know, and and pulling that off, and it's. Uh, it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, in, in Southeast Asia, one of the um, real difficulties we had, the, the one flaw in the statute I was referencing is, is they have to travel to have sex with minors in foreign countries. So if they move there, that's a whole different deal. And it's, a, oh, it's wow. more difficult. And so we would have, there are tons of almost all related to one religious organization or another, churches, and you would have teachers in those in those schools, American teachers that were teaching English as a second language, and uh, a good percentage of them were pedophiles, and they were there because they were preferential. They liked a certain age group, and they mm. would teach that age group, and they would have gain their trust. Yeah, just ready made <clears throat> ready made victims, and they would. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was it was stunning, and we we arrested a a, a lot of those teachers that were over there, and um, yeah. <clears throat> well, I, I you know one thing that I think we talked about this when we were originally had this conversation, Greg, is that you know you said there there were five of you who worked kind of the Southeast Asian mm-hmm. beat. Yep. 
And, you know, I'm sure there were several other uh, agents that might have worked similar beats in the United States. Mainly and, Central and, South America, Eastern Europe. Um, yeah, we were all over the place. But, you know, the, uh, at the end of the day, there's a finite amount of investigative resources for this, right? Like right. when – and these, these – I kind of read about this, these hotlines that people can call to agencies that are actually trying to – prevent human trafficking and, and, you know, relocate children that have gone missing, et cetera, are just getting swamped with this bullshit. Yeah. Like the works are getting completely gummed up. Uh, you know, what few works there are, are getting completely gummed up by this absurdity. Yeah. Oh, no question. Especially here in, um, in Utah, there was a, a couple years back, maybe three, four years ago now, um, Everybody was convinced that every single massage parlor in town that had an Asian name was a place where human trafficking was taking place. They're absolutely convinced that everybody that was working in there was here and somehow had their identifications taken from them and they were being forced to give these massages. And um, so there were tons of calls about that and people and it was it was it just wasn't that wasn't the case. And I'm not in any way saying that the people that worked in those some of those places were treated fairly and kindly. I mean, it's it's not true, but it wasn't. That doesn't make it human trafficking. Right. Well, Greg, thank you so much for coming on. I, I mean, more than anything, what I wanted to do was just sort of maybe try and pour pour some cool water on the flames that are being fanned right now uh, and just get the word out that that, you know, while there are real problems uh, surrounding this. Uh, it's not what people are getting excited about right now, and maybe we should be a little more, uh, a little more circumspect uh, when it comes to our our zeal. Yeah. To to <clears throat> always to consider people. the source of the information. That's good for any topic. Right. Yeah. And, and, and if yeah. I could just real quick for for people that are really interested in this, and mm. again, please understand, I'm not a. Uh, a huge fan usually of, of most of what the federal government does because we can confuse things and make it very complicated. But they, the State Department does put out what they call the Trafficking in Persons Report every year. And for those who are interested, you should read it because it, it goes through horrific things that are happening in different countries, how they look at those things, which countries are on lists. And it, and it lays it out pretty well year after year about where the real issues are. And you'll see that there is, because I, I don't want to at all sound like I'm downplaying human trafficking. It's a horrible problem in our world. It's, it's right. not going on in the United States the way it's portrayed by a current crop of politicians. Well, thanks so much for coming on and uh, depressing us all and making us all feel horrible. Uh, <laughs> well, we, I, it, we genuinely appreciate oh, it. Oh, I'm, I'm very thankful I could do that for you. Well, friends, that's it for this week's surprisingly dark show. Yes, indeed. Hey, if you've ever written a pro-slavery letter to someone, we'd love to hear about it. Send us an email at howto at howtoheretic.com. Or if you can, th you think you can bust my fucking square dancing songwriting chops, you can leave me a voicemail about it at 903-8882, which is 903-884-6986. This song must also be extremely racist. I'm also on Twitter at howtoheretic. And once again, we give lovely thanks to our lovely patrons. Yes, and to Cody Layton, who is our shortest book in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks to all of you for tuning in. Bye, friends. Bye.